Uh, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Just a few nods should suffice. Okay, terrific. And some smiles as well, so I'm in good hands. Um, so, um, uh, public speaking along with uh, contending with the Taliban hold about an equal level for me in terms of anxiety, so I'll beg for your patience and I'm counted already on the considerable generosity of a borrowed laptop and uh, everyone else's goodwill. Um, and we'll, we'll get through this. And I think we've agreed to have some questions afterwards as well, which is perhaps the most fun part uh, of all of this. So um, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so the only way I know perhaps how to enter into uh, this uh, mottled and varied life is um, with, uh, to display in full force my uh, uh, geekdom. So I'm going to let that geek f flag fly and uh, begin with an anecdote about the poet Ezra Pound, um, who was at a coffee shop in Paris being interviewed. And the interviewer turned to Pound and asked him what the point of a poem was, or what the point of art was, to which Pound shot back, what is the point of a rose? Now, I was 15 when I read that in some uh, school out in the country in England, and I found that lyrical and even transcendent and bordered on everything that I uh, aspired to with all these bohemian fantasies that teenage boys have. Um, and now, about 25 years later, I find that a little glib, or I'm not sure that I'm completely convinced by the sentiment much that I like it. I like the idea of art for art's sake. I even enjoy my entertainment and all the rest of it. Um, but I'm not completely convinced. And so along the way, I've picked up a few other heroes, a few other mentors. And the other one I want to hold with Pound's contention is uh, the architect Louis Kahn, uh, who was an obsession of mine when I then went to university in Philadelphia. Now, Louis Kahn is uh, famous for having constructed about three of the great architectural masterpieces uh, around the world when most architects would be lucky to even have made one. He's also famous because he was found dead in the public bathroom of Penn Station with his passport on him and his name scratched out, $50 in his pocket, and he remained there for about three days. Um, but he did make the three architectural masterpieces. Now, Kahn said in a lecture at a library that I used to walk by in college, he said to a few students that even a brick wants to be something. Even a brick wants to be something. So now in my muddled head in college, on the one hand, I have even a brick wants to be something, and on the other hand, but what's the point of a rose? So we've got beauty or art for art's sake, and on the other hand, we've got even a brick wants to be something. So in that contention, I run off with all my aspirations for high art and all the rest of it to New York City and to get into high cinema and transcendence, and I get the very auspicious job of being a cameraman on MTV's Jackass. <laughs> So with my dreams of high art and cinema and uh, being drunk on black and white films where everybody dies and an extension of subtitles, that's what I did. So I shouldered my way around, I carried boxes for a little while, uh, uh, entered into a great love affair with America and found myself with a few cameras. As a result of the strike in 9-11, I got to working with a few fashion photographers. A French fashion photographer took me under his wing. Um, at that point, while working on Victoria's Secret's catalogues to the envy of my friends and to the absolute tedium of my own high art aspirations, um, a very grisly Frenchman walked in with a battered camera around his neck held with a red shoelace. And he, and he, said, and he looked at all the studio lighting and the $5,000 a day rental for a studio in New York and said, I don't even have a flash on my camera, this is rubbish. He and I talked for about seven hours and he was a conflict photographer who had just gotten back from Somalia. Um, and that was it. And then I sort of packed it up, took a few savings, and uh, ran off. Uh, lost in a, a few dreams and a few narratives of documentary photographers and filmmakers who had been my passion anyway. Um, so at that point, having uh, worked a year for a temp job and picked up some black and white film, which I pumped through the beloved German Leica camera that I, I, I decided they were going to bury me with, um, I set off on my first uh, project. And for all the talk in the PR about technology and all the rest of it, I've got to begin this story by saying that it was actually about nostalgia, first off. It wasn't a forward-looking thing at all. It was just being drunk on one's heroes. And being drunk on one's heroes, one of my heroes was the great photographer Robert Frank, 
uh, a Swiss Jew who turned up in America and uh, piled his family into a car and took off across the country and was uh, unnaturalized. But after years and years of documenting this, I produced maybe one of the greatest visual documents about America at that time. And being schoolboyishly ambitious, I thought it was time for a newer chapter of that. And perhaps even not knowing it, I understood um, that uh, even though I was, had this nostalgia kick with black and white photography, um, I understood that people understood their history, at least in America. They understood it through this thing. And this thing for me at that time, looking at photography, was black and white 35 millimeter photography. So all the great images that I had looked at had been shot largely in this format. And, and that is how people understood it, from civil rights movements, Gordon Parks, Robert Frank, and the list went on and on from the war photography of Robert Capra into World War II. This is how America, and this is how people largely took their visual language and their narrative. So while the nostalgia had made me look back, what it had given me, in technologically speaking, was an affinity for the tool where which I might try and shoulder this new chapter of America into the, into the old narrative. So I'm going to show you a few photos from that project. And essentially, as I uh, go through it, we'll also find out a little bit of what I looked at. And, um, and how I even tried upending, ambitiously enough, uh, some of this um, old story. Okay. Um, let's start here. So this was, um, I ended up in uh, Chester, Pennsylvania. And this lovely woman here, had, she's a Muslim convert, and they'd met a Sufi uh, in Sri Lanka who they'd brought back uh, while they were all heading off to a concert, which at that time was called Woodstock, which they didn't know how big a deal it was going to be. And they packed both their religious manuals and their drugs with them to head off to, uh, to the concert. They brought the Sufi sheikh with, him, with them. Sorry. And uh, while, while there and the music was raging, he sat there and they brought some of their friends who were there in body paint naked to sit with the, uh, the Islamic sheikh and listen to what he had to say. And, um, and, um, and, and they asked him, they said, what, did, uh, you know, what do you think of all this? Some of them had already converted. They said, what do you think of all this? These people are naked. We're very sorry. And he said, he said my God, you know, look at all the goodwill. Look at their smiles. You know? And that was that. So a community was born of the oldest American uh, Muslim communities, indigenous American Muslim communities. She had been running off to Boston Ballet uh, and came out here to Chester, Pennsylvania, where they created this community, and, um, and they've now buried him in, that, uh, in what is the first uh, uh, Sufi American saint shrine in Pennsylvania. And um, she kindly let, let me get her photograph there. So we'll push on. What else I found? A oh, so. There's a, stubbornly, there's a way I want to talk about war photography, which is actually, despite having been embedded in all the rest of it, which I actually don't want to look at war. I don't want to look at guns and turbans, or at least skirt that or play with that idea. Now, this was the Bosnian community in New York. Um, the man at the very bottom is perhaps more interesting because he's called the general, and he had his one hand, his fingers blown off in uh, Sarajevo and had come with the rest of the community in New York where they'd buckled down and started building schools and all the rest of it and mosques. And he was determined to show me how good his balance was despite having gained 30 pounds over the past five years. And uh, I snapped this one of him here. And he was very interesting because at that time, this was around 2003, people were running around with Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. And I was actually set for, to go to Iraq at the time and uh, with some friends, but I was quite torn about it because I felt that the images I would take would go back to a, a pimple 22-year-old recently minted college graduate at an editorial board somewhere, um, and they would actually say what the, what the photographs meant. So with that ambivalence, I knew that I also wanted to do this project in North America about Muslims and American Islam. Also, as partially intellectually, as a challenge to this clash of civilizations idea that if, in fact, you did have indigenous American Muslims and they were a long-standing community and that they had been in the community way before 9-11, that you had something to talk about that may, perhaps was even more compelling than some of the, uh, what they call in history the Bang Bang uh, abroad. Um, and these guys had seen Bang Bang. New York building and um, as American as anybody else. Um, headscarf and a BMX. Sometimes a photograph is just about that. 
and I couldn't avoid that. Um, this is uh, an American Muslim school in New Jersey. Um, it was in some controversy uh, a little while ago um, when, it, when the New York Post got a hold of it. But this is what I found when I went to photograph there. Just kids, uh, with their bikes, and uh, all the color that goes with that, or perhaps not so much of the black and white photo photograph. Um, so this is uh, an, an amazing imam in uh, Connecticut. So his name was David Howard. Uh, you would have seen him elsewhere in a few Madonna music videos when he was a model in the 90s and signed to Wilhelmina. He and I had shared a few friends in the fashion industry. And um, he'd been in South Africa and picked up a Quran and, and, uh, uh, and things had shifted for him. So he'd taken his savings and run off to South Africa uh, sorry, it stuck around in South Africa, then got run off to pick up Arabic in Syria, gone to Mauritania, and then Jordan after that, and come back after seven, eight years qualified uh, in the Islamic sciences to both speak it and teach the language. So he ended up an imam in Connecticut. Uh, having been um, in Italian vogue, his first job when he came back was working at a parking lot as a parking attendant uh, while he was waiting for the position to open up. Um, uh, this was in his house as he was packing to go to the Middle East. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, Northern California. I was staying at the, another Sufi uh, community, and they were outside guiding cars, and the level of trust moved me, that a door was open and someone had left their child while going to move the car, and they all were pretty tightly packed in there. Um, so you can see, uh, this is the project where I started to learn about photography. Uh, but this is very interesting. This is, I made it to Chicago a couple of years later in between assignments. Uh, this is, uh, when speaking about the African-American Muslim community, uh, I realized a few things, which is that one has to uh, let them on some level speak for themselves, because, given that they've been through civil rights and have been much maligned. And one of the very interesting things was that, despite his controversy, uh, Louis Farrakhan, in the black community he's, he's, he's quite loved for the social activism and the things he provided to people in the, um, in the inner cities over the years and stuff like that, even while they acknowledge that they may not all agree that the leader came from a spaceship and all the rest of it. So this was very interesting. So this was at, um, uh, in Chicago and they said you've got to see how these guys turned up in the cities with their suits and pressed and, and upright. And so that's what I was after in the shot. I know someone who was trying to get a photograph of him for four years, or trying to get an interview, and they couldn't do it. And I sort of turned around at this funeral where he was uh, a few feet from him. And uh, uh, the more intense gazes I got from uh, uh, his men, particularly this guy right there, <laughs> I, I got the shot anyway that I wanted. So, um, uh, OK, uh, 50 Cent's music producer. Name's Mecca Donna. Uh, ran. Ran when I was clicking pictures, said, Oh, no, no, you can't use those ones. I don't have my Louis Vuitton scarf. <laughs> so she grabbed her scarf um, and uh, got her a hairpin and then uh, said, You guys don't know what you're doing to 50 Cent and a few other freestylers and said, Let me take the mic. And that's when I wished uh, I wasn't a photographer and just shooting, getting recording audio. Uh, my son. Ends up, I'm part of the story too. And I make no claims to objectivity with anything in regard to my life, but I can be transparent about my biases. And I hope there's some virtue in that. Um, a fashion designer in New York who uh, frustrated with the need to um, wear garb where she felt she could cover herself, went to Fashion Institute, uh, graduated top of her class, starts her own business in New York, and now sells around the world. That's one of my favorite photos. Ah, a mentor. Uh, there I am, schoolboyishly thinking I've invented the wheel. Uh, you get a little older, you realize you're just standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, this photo is very dear to me. The, the lady on the, in the middle there is Marilyn Abercrombie. Uh, if you're a photo geek like me, that means something to you. But it will mean even more on the photo on the far right is her late husband, Thomas Abercrombie. Uh, those are photos of him on the kitchen table there. Uh, Thomas Abercrombie was a triple threat. 
Um, he's one of the great American photographers because he could both write, uh, shoot photos, and then was also an explorer in his own right and actually broke new, new ground. And um, in 1968, he ended up in West Africa and became Muslim and took the name Omar, but kept it a little under wraps because he wasn't sure how that would be taken and uh, then proceeded to push on into the Middle East, West Africa, and all the rest of it, and open up all this new terrain. I mean, I simply would not, my, my field would not be what it is uh, without him. It's, it's unthinkable to imagine what it is. So I went to meet Marilyn uh, Abercrombie. And the camera I was using for this while using 35 millimeter, for anyone who cares about photography, we're in the art school, so we should honor that tradition, it was a wide lux um, camera that makes these panoramic images. And the thing jammed. She particularly loved this photograph because as it jammed and as I printed it, uh, he's looking over her through that window, that photograph. That was nice for me because it meant that uh, this inner madness of this photographic obsession meant something to someone at some point. So you can see even at this point though that I care very little, I very care very little about who's actually seeing the photographs. It, this is my, a rose is a rose, <laughs> a stage in my life. Uh, women's shelter in Baltimore. Uh, there are taboos in all communities. Uh, this is a woman who's very brave enough to set up a women's sh a shelter for battered women. She didn't want to be photographed. Halfway house. Uh, huge uh, Muslim community amongst the uh, African-American Muslims who are also in prison. It's a halfway house where they come out. Uh, this was the most, uh, this affected me the most um, personally because I, I saw that, uh, that ev every sentence that someone gets is always a life sentence and they carry it around with them. So there's not much chance for material redemption in these lives, but these people come out and, um, and for them the stakes are perhaps the highest. We'll plug through. Uh, I, I didn't, when editing, I didn't actually pick this photograph out. A friend picked it out who was not Muslim. And he said, God, look at the elegance in her hand. And that he saw that made, perhaps suggested he has a better eye than I do because we might more typically tend to see people who are covered up. So her kids. Uh, uh, this was great for all my bohemian fantasies. Um, he's a sheikh in Washington, D.C., Noura Dean Durkee. His name was uh, Gerald Durkee. He was friends with Andy Warhol, had a loft in, he was a very up-and-coming painter um, in New York in his time, and uh, ran off um, with a friend who was a gun runner from Afghanistan. They took some money, went to the Middle East, became Muslim, came back as sheikh, now helps refugees in, uh, in Virginia. Uh, the funeral of Warath Dean Muhammad, Largest conversion. Most people from the Nation of Islam jumped ship in the 70s when the son of Elijah Muhammad uh, joined traditional Islam and they all followed him. This was his funeral. I was the only person allowed to photograph this. And all dignitaries on the left-hand side from all over the world came out for that. Uh, Madrasa in uh, Washington, D.C. Sheikh Durki and his wife. A bit of American pastoral there. Uh, this is great. This is my backyard, West Village, New York City. Uh, an Afghan man who ran a store there selling Afghan uh, artifacts for about uh, 30 years in New York. When 9-11 happened, the gay community came out to uh, support him and protect him, which is uh, about as wonderful and uh, beautiful and American an anecdote as anyone could hope for. And they, they recognized him as uh, one of their own and all just uh, fellow New Yorkers. And when he got a, I think someone um, threw something through the window, they all came out to protect the shop, which was in the West Village. It has since closed, but it was very sweet to let me take that photograph. Uh, Nora Durkee, the wife of Jared Durkee, she writes children's books. Sometimes the photograph's just better wordless. Maybe this is just about the moment. This is my Henri Cartier-Bresson moment. Uh, in the New Jersey Sports School. Oh, uh, uh, two of the uh, Muslim congressmen, the most prominent being uh, Keith Ellison. Was, uh, Farrak, another picture of Farrakhan. Uh, my friend swore I would uh, people need, put this one in. Uh, you may really see him at a tender moment. Okay, back to that. All right, so that's my uh, pound um, chapter. So I'm working away and uh, trying to make a living. 
having ditched fashion photography and I've, my savings having run out. And um, now I'm sh by some miracle I'm shooting for National Geographic because they couldn't get access to a mosque where there had been uh, some arrests. And those arrests, um, you know, with Homeland Security, they said, well, we don't trust anybody to come in, but um, we'll take, there's this guy loitering around here who we trust, so we'll have him take the photo. So I'm now shooting for National Geographic, I have stuff in New York Times, and um, I get a call and the earthquake happens that I can run off to Haiti. Now, this is very interesting when the technology happens. I've packed my digital camera, um, and I'm ready to run off. And we're first responders. We're there within six hours. There's no rule of law, no electricity, no food. Uh, we're crashing. The second responders have not been able to come, and they've got our tents and everything like that. So I've got a 20-pound backpack and just my camera, and we're pretty much sleeping in the dirt to get these photos. And we found a few French uh, people who have a satellite and minister in Port-au-Prince, which is the UN compound, and we'll be able to stream some of our images. So the NGO decides that if I can make the images small enough on uh, a bit of battery life on my laptop, that we can actually pump this straight to Flickr. If we pump it straight to Flickr, we can, by telephone, even get people to monitor this uh, hour to hour and see what happens with raising money. Uh, this is a new beast for me at that point. And now, having gone privately for seven, eight years with a documentary product and, uh, and had um, a solo show, uh, this is what I end up doing. Now, this is very interesting because it suddenly flips. It's less about the photos here, but more what the photos can do. So as we look at them, I'm going to tell you the amount of money we raised as the photos were, were streamed online over a period of 10 days. And this is uh, central Port-au-Prince uh, after the earthquake. It's people running off with uh, UN food. So that's about two or three photos. That's about a day into it. On this day here, there were uh, two, two or three people who were caught under the rubble. Um, I documented that the entire day and streamed the photos to Flickr. These are the people trying to break through. As cars went by, they stopped the cars and asked people to, uh, uh, to keep quiet while they heard, listened to voices and people who had dying battery life on their cell phones here. In, th in three days, uh, we got to $350,000 globally just by posting the images on Flickr, not on my website, not sending them, just by posting to Flickr and tagging it. $350,000 in three days. This was, uh, I'd never been convinced. I'm sort of ethnically Pashtun and from the troubled <laughs> regions between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I'd never been convinced entirely by the gauntlet thrown by a lot of conflict photography or crisis photography, which had suggested that, that if you just showed the gore, people would come out. I was convinced that even some of the better stories, some of the humane stories, even the heroic ones, where you do get to see that side by side with uh, the more tragic ones, that those could inspire to and lead people to reach into their pockets. And at this point, the digital streaming is just a means to an end. Um, and if we're going to, to take Pound's dictum and push it a little, uh, sorry, not Pound's dictum, we're going to take Louis Kahn's dictum that even a brick wants to be something, we ask that perhaps what does a photograph want to be? In this moment, at this point in my life, I wanted the photograph simply to, to bring in the money. And this is what it was. These were people in Haiti who had uh, taken what little supplies and were, were meeting it out to the local people in the village who'd been starving now uh, since the earthquake. This is how they'd organized, structured, and, gained, and, and were, were doing everything by themselves and doing it all by daylight because the electricity, there was no electricity to speak of. Uh, that, the previous photo, that was about five, six days into it. At that point, we hit the 1.2 million mark. That's five days into it. So the airport was blocked. Nobody was allowed in. When you were at the airport, um, smugglers were, were getting the stuff, taking it to the black market. We were having to go to the black market to buy your stuff from the black market to give back to the people when the smugglers would go back and take it from the people anyway. This here, when I was leaving the UN compound at Minister, um, uh, I walked by the, the makeshift hospital area and they were taking a child and transporting the child to the newer uh, hospital digs because this place had simply it had just expanded uh, to its limit. And, the, and, and what had happened was the, the, the previous hospital with, during the earthquake, the previous hospital with the father visiting and the mother there had collapsed and only the child had survived. So within hours of its birth, the child was, uh, was now orphaned and uh, being shuttled on to its next uh, existence. 
We hit the two million mark at about seven days. More children. Uh, I went into the black market where nobody really wanted to go, and this guy passed by me bobbing his head with no headphones on them. And I asked him in my broken French, picked up in a public school in England when I sh should not have been reading pound poetry, perhaps been studying harder. I asked him where he was actually going. He said, I'm going to a party. You want to come? You know? <laughs> and I, and uh, I said, uh, no, I won't. I said, but I'll, I'll get a photograph here. He said, he said we keep partying. You know, so the resilience was amazing of the Haitians. A riot. Uh, I jumped out of the car and ran towards a UN truck that was tossing rice out of the back. This is what happens on the street uh, when people don't have food and, and they're throwing things out. This is what it looks like in the middle. Uh, people are getting crushed to death and um, they're throwing the food out. Now, some of those hands are smugglers. They grab the rice, they throw it in the back of a 4x4, four four, take it to the black market. They sell it at the black market, which I showed earlier. And um, they sell it to both people and back to the NGOs. By that day uh, was day nine, and we raised now, uh, I think, two and a half million dollars. These people, they, we built a home uh, with some of the money almost immediately. And uh, these people thanked us for the roofs over their head, and their roofs were bed sheets. They, they were sharing the toilet paper that they had. I think there were 600 people in that refugee camp. One of the guys from the camps who was helping out, incredibly resilient, amazing guy, uh, pulled up by this car, saw three suits. I asked them uh, where they were, w what they were doing and uh, where they were going. I said they said they were turning up, they were going to work. I said, where are you going to work? They said, Haiti. <laughs> but they wore their suits, you know. Amazing resilience in these people. The capital. Hold on to that image. I'll reference that later. By the end of that stint, after 10 days, and streaming it onto Flickr, we raised three and a half million dollars in 10 days. And I knew that something had shifted with regard to my interest in documentary photography, that it perhaps wasn't just in, the, in a gallery where I could um, uh, show things. And, um, or even affect some, or even talk to people and have a conversation about it. So we fast forward now, and I, I leave off for an embed. And the project that um, I do is called um, Bass Track. And Bass Track is very interesting because, for all my suspicion about the embeds um, previously, um, this one seemed to hold out the Holy Grail in terms of journalism. And the holy grail for me was that what we did was, with these photographs was we embedded with the Marines, the 1-8 Marines in Helmand, uh, just outside of Kandahar, for an entire year. And photographers, video people, writers rotated, went through that rotation uh, over a year. And I was one of the photographers there. And um, uh, what we did was we gave the material to traditional me uh, print media. So New York Times, Newsweek, Time took it, and all the rest of it. That was the least interesting part for me. What we did also with the material was dump it on the social network. So it went to Facebook, uh, and it went on Twitter, and it was constantly going on. Now, the conversations that resulted from these, uh, this project for a year was that you had people, the parents of Marines, having conversations with both diaspora and native Afghans about the war. And nobody told them what to say. And they were having those conversations on the same thread on Facebook, which accounted at this time, and I think it's more now, for 40% of all internet activity. And it was happening globally like that. So while the, while everybody, the powers that be agreed to the project, they also started getting nervous as this happened. Facebook then said that it was uh, their project of the year for a forward-thinking transmedia. And, and then it got a little bit more publicity as well. At that point, when the editorial boards weren't using the photographs as we wanted them to be used, or we didn't even care at that point because they were going out to the social network anyway. Uh, so let's look at some photos. This is from Kabul. My, at the time of my embed, when I got there to my embed, it got canceled. The Pentagon pulled the plug. Everybody got a little nervous. The thing was getting too big. 
but the cat was already out of the bag. The, the guy uh, um, doing this project uh, at, at, that, at that point had, if, if not literally, figuratively had his Julian Assange photo up on the wall and thought that we were just going to run with it from there. Having seen conversations like the following occur uh, on Facebook where I saw uh, one person who's with the Marines family say, we should just pull our boys out and nuke Afghanistan. Have a conversation with another Afghan and, and after about eight or nine entries later, admit after a day or two of this back and forth, well, I did know two Afghans in college who helped paint my friend's house and they weren't so bad. And having won a few awards, having gotten my dream to work for the, the newspapers and print media that I wanted to work for out of college, I can tell you that that was, that was the best moment that I've had perhaps in photojournalism or photography. To realize that was extraordinary, to have that conversation. And how did we shoot these photos? With my beloved Leica and the 35 millimeter and the gorgeous silver prints that result from that? With our iPhones. And that's how we streamed them. And these are the photographs that came out of that. And this is Kabul. This is, uh, I'm sorry, let me hop back. That's the presidential palace that's been bombed uh, you know, during the war with the Russians. Uh, I started, for, I, I don't know, do we have any art people here from the art department? Something like that? Yes, no? Okay, well, we won't indulge it too much. But the temptation with a uh, phone camera is to get up close and take photos. But because of the filter that we used here, I was in love with the old war photographers who I knew in the view cameras, the people that I'd studied in photography, August Sander, uh, and all the rest of it, who used these, Matthew Arnold, who used these big glass daguerreotypes and all the rest of it, tintypes, and used it as if it were in a, in a painterly way. And that's how I tried to use it uh, to an extent, to honor that tradition, but also slap the iPhone uh, um, punk rock <laughs> aesthetic uh, uh, into that narrative, to drop it in there. That's the capital. This was a, um, a refugee camp. Uh, from Kandahar, it's the entrance to the mosque where the people whose legs have been blown off, they've got the, um, oh boy, someone help me, I forget what they're called uh, when you go to the hospital. Th you know, those uh, th crutches, thank you. <laughs> I didn't get my coffee today, so there you go. Uh, the black market. <clears throat> so you remember Haiti, black markets? These universals start popping up. This is the black market where, very dangerous, where... Afghans and Taliban who have stolen in their fights with, from, from the U.S. Uh, military, stolen the gear from the military, come sell it at the black market, sell the stuff at the, at the black market to other Afghans and even uh, to other Americans. Everything from jackets, guns, and all the rest of it. This is, it's literally, the black market in the West tends to mean somewhere where you can buy something online on eBay or something. The black, it's, a, it's a geographic spot uh, uh, out there. Um, lifestyle shot just after Friday prayers. Uh, this photo I'm, I'm schoolboyishly attached to. It's, uh, there's a dome of a mosque there. It's a little abstract. Uh, Omar's still struggling between his brick and his rose. Perhaps he doesn't have to choose. Maybe you do have to choose. I don't know. Sometimes you're just there and something's just beautiful. More beauty, perhaps not the photo, more the moment. Kite flying, great uh, Afghan pastime. This is a Pashtun enclave on the mountains there where barely anybody goes. Uh, but this is where they go to unwind, the people. People like ice cream. <laughs> Kids in a dump, found some party hats. Remember the suits in Haiti? Yes, I think it was uh, Simon Wiesenthal has a great line in one of his books when he left the concentration camps that they found a ton of lipstick. And uh, they realized that the lipstick was, um, some women used to put the lipstick on sparingly. And what it did was afford them their dignity when they'd been robbed of it um, from without. So lipstick, party hat, suits, it's amazing. What, uh, uh, and the resilience, people's spirit. Some of these I don't want to explain. <laughs> Sandstorm. 
It's all with the iPhone. These long sticks they use to pull kites down, um, which they fight with. And what they used to do is they used to dip the glass in gum and crushed glass, and then they fight with their kites on the strings. And whoever can cut the other person's kite off can claim the kite. Uh, after a few, they used to do this on rooftops. Um, after some, you know, some ki some kids got hurt with this glass on there, you know, it sort of cut somebody. They sort of banned that. But these kids do it anyway. Uh, I don't know, take your pick, is it uh, X-Men or hipsters even in Afghanistan? I couldn't resist. This one I'm very attached to. I've got the guy in the Shilva Kameez uh, will be polite and say he's fixing his string. That's holding it up. And then we've got the other guy who looks like he could be buying espresso in front of me in Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, it's not all guns and turbans and, uh, and there's a very rich culture there. Uh, I love this photograph because it's a good photograph. No, it's not. It's just a snapshot. This is my driver, Zamarai, in Pashto. It's a beautiful, beautiful name. It means fierce lion. There are about 17 different names for a fierce lion in Pashto. They're very resilient people. And he said, tell Americans that we, are, we, we love life and that we also have the best pomegranate juice. It's world renowned. <laughs> and there we go. So the embed ended, we leave Kabul, and I decide that um, we've got to get out and we've got to see something because um, there's got to be more to it than all this. Um, and where I, what I do then is head out, unembedded, into, uh, towards Bamiyan, along the Silk Road which now you, you cannot get to um, uh, because the roads are blocked off. So the State Department has even contacted me and asked about my, my last trip there. Um, you have to, Kabul is surrounded by Taliban. They call Hamid Karzai, uh, I, I doubt he likes the, the moniker, but they call him the mayor of Kabul. Um, and, he is, and so when you head out, they're surrounded by Taliban. But if you can break through break through that line, you can actually get to Bamiyan, which is where the Buddhas were that, were, that the Taliban blew up. And I knew that there was something out there about the plurality and the diversity of the Silk Road and, and all this you know, rubbish we call nation states that we sort of slapped on this very porous uh, region. This, as uh, the one driver referred to him, was who, this one guy on the bike who pulled us over and asked everybody's uh, ethnic lineage. And he, um, this was one of our dear Taliban brothers, the, the, <laughs> the driver affectionately called him. I, I didn't feel that much affection, to be very honest. But, um, so they pulled us over on the way out, <clears throat> but were nice enough. And we kept going. We've left Kabul at this point. Here's Bamiyan. That's where the Buddhas were. I don't know if you can see that in the light. Um, I'm gonna, I think I'm hold back on an anecdote and we'll just look at some photos and I'll share one with you. Um, these people lived in caves up there in the, in the area where the Buddhas were. And they didn't know any other life. They couldn't understand why anybody would want to live down in the valley. It was unfathomable. The reason I like this photo is actually just because the, the back wall hanging, the wall, whatever it is, cellophane, just looks like a Mark Rothko. <laughs> At least in my head. 
She could be a little girl at a gallery, or perhaps a mud gallery. It's inside their house. It's their family Quran. This is Bamiyan, the marketplace. Bamiyan's interesting because they really pride themselves on their culture there. There's a mix of Hazaras, Tajiks up there. So you see the Asiatic influence from China coming all the way down to the Silk Road. They're very proud of themselves because they kicked the Russians out and they also kicked the Taliban out. And for them the distinction is very clear that, that, they, are, that they have single-handedly saved Afghanistan and they've saved its culture. And this in that regard felt like some of these great Englishmen who sort of tre trekked out and, and had gone through time a little bit. This was my moment to feel that, okay, perhaps I was coming to something um, that had been a little untouched by war. Not completely, but a little untouched by war. And um, this was their marketplace. Now, one of the people who wrote the article that accompanied some of these photos um, and, was, and had made another visit there at one point, had interviewed some of the people there and said that, um, and, and, had, and had heard the call to prayer. Now, when they heard the call to prayer, they thought, oh my God, let's quickly write that into the article. And written into the article that like, well, then I heard the call to prayer an ominous sound as I looked at the Buddha's cavity up there in the wall. When I spoke a little more to the people and said, oh, that, you know, um, what do you make of the fact that it's, you know, Islam and your practicing Muslims have brought these Buddhas down? And they said to me, Islam kept the Buddhas there for a thousand years. It was a very different perspective. You know, so on the one hand, even the best intentioned and most educated of journalists from the West was taking this moment in time to paintbrush the history of the region with what Islam meant. And in the perspective of the illiterate people there, it actually protected the Buddhists for a thousand years before the extremists showed up. Make of that what you will. This is the marketplace in Bamiyan. Very proud of his solar panel. We're going to save Afghanistan. We're technologically minded, he says to me with my iPhone. He says, Do, can you set up a solar panel? I say, no. He goes, well, you just keep taking pictures. I'll save the country. I told him we have a great bike road culture in North America. He couldn't care less. He told me to take my photo and move on. A game of cracking eggs to see whose egg doesn't crack. I've never seen that game elsewhere. Hazaras. Shepherds, I wandered off further. I asked them about the war. They said, isn't that done? And the other great romance of mine as an English public schoolboy was uh, Sam Shepard and Jack Kerouac and On the Road and all of this stuff. And this just, you know, I was lost in an American landscape that I found out in Afghanistan even a little bit. Everybody's got these prayer beads. You shepherds. I'm going to show my age, and probably some of your ages too. Little Rascals, anybody watch that? This is my Little Rascals shot. Out there in Afghanistan. I don't know where he got a... I'll offend people, a Boston or a Brooklyn Dodgers hat on, but there you go. Landmines, but people still go back to work. Old Russian tanks. Soccer. I am from England originally. A game I hope my son never picks up, which is to tie a nail to a bit of stick and shoot it from a bow and arrow at your friends when you lose your soccer game. Well, they were very proud of that. I left the edit a little fat. I want you to see I'm in the process of editing these, so you can see me trying to choose one. I like that one. It's between that or that. I'm going to have to weigh in with a vote later.
So then we push on and there's Bande Amar, which is a frozen lake. Well, it's frozen when we see it. And we end up following this guy who a lot of these people have only heard about the war. And, um, and have had a lifestyle that has been in, untouched for a millennia. They were very proud of that speaker that someone had brought to them a few years ago so that they could hear the call to prayer. The women who were marching off for a wedding in the next village. The imam I chased. The car had broken down, broken down three times on the way out here. And so we trekked off following this uh, imam who was going to show us this frozen lake that he convinced us was one of the great wonders of the world. And he was right. That was it. I've never seen anything like it. This was their mosque. I didn't have these in the edit, but I put these in the edit um, looking out the window at Shangri-La. Put those in there this afternoon. The boats they couldn't use, that's the mountain range. If you can see on the bottom left is the Imam collecting holy water for people back in the village because uh, a child was sick and they didn't want to make any decisions and they washed him in the holy water. His book, whenever you ask him a question, he would refer to his notes that he'd been keeping since the, for over 30 years and then he would answer authoritatively on what exactly happened that year. Back to Kabul. So I've got my brick in one hand, and sometimes even frozen urine is a rose from their outhouse. And that's one of my favorite photos. Hazara. You don't hear much about them in these uh, categories to which the region gets reduced. Good sport, this kid. I kept taking photos and photos till I got the one I wanted. Back to that. So let's look at some of these. At this point, I take a break and I decide to go to uh, I decide to go to Pakistan for my vacation, the border country. <laughs> and um, I decide that I get robbed by the police and then the military. Um, and I go to this Pashtun enclave where it's, there's an area there called Rari Goth. Rari Goth is interesting because Rari Goth is, uh, also hides a guy, Daoud Ismail. So the, neither the government, the ISI, or even um, uh, uh, regular people go there. He's completely walled off. He's on number two on Interpol, and um, he brings in most of the drugs from Afghanistan into Pakistan and then disperses it through Europe. So, there, so on the way there, there's this... Um, I, I start shooting Pashtuns and Pashtun culture and all that. that. And they have a Pashtun cinema. And at the cinema, where you go there, the guys from Kandahar, Kabul, all the rest of it, who go there to blow off steam, you know, they bring their drugs, they get high. And at, the, and at that cinema, and we'll get there, these are kids who loiter in the back. They're sort of glue sniffing um, and uh, picking up drugs. Some of them are servicing men in the bathroom. Uh, and here are um, gay guys some of them drag queens who come up front and dance when the musical numbers come up on the Western movie. 
No. That reminded me of John Travolta, but I don't even know if he'd know who has ever seen Saturday Night Fever. And this is the cinema. This is them dancing away. There are more kidnappings and killings in this one location in, in that, than, there, than there are even out on the street, because it's pretty dangerous. These guys were great. These guys were from Miransha in Waziristan. Uh, Miransha is interesting because it's the most heavily droned bit of uh, ground on the planet. Uh, a lot of their younger siblings were either dead or uh, wake up when they hear any buzzing sound screaming because of the sound of drones. He was also from Waziristan. These are the guys dancing. Uh, at this point, I was just remembering my uh, favorite punk rock photographers who shot at CBGBs with their flashlights, and I thought, if not Iggy Pop, why not these guys too? This guy was kind of like the Kandahari Ryan Gosling. They were very hip, very cool, a lot of swagger, insisted I take his photograph. Um, he had his back turned Kandahari hat, so they even have a, a fashion sense there. I said, what do you make of the gay guys up front dancing? He goes, aren't they God's people too? So it makes you reconsider what fundamentalism might be in that region. The drug dealer. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the drug dealer. Oh, uh, the kids in the back, they broke my heart. Look at that guy in the back there smoking his joint. He just wanted his photo taken. I love the geometry of his head. Sometimes a rose is a flat top or a brick, a brick hat, I don't know. Okay, enough of this. Let's watch, uh, let's see if we can pull up this trailer. Okay. So, on and off for about two years, I was in that region and we shot a film about a humanitarian, Abdul Sattar Idi, um, who runs the largest private ambulance service and orphanage in the world. Um, he threw a challenge out to us. He's quite famous because he also sleeps and makes his life amongst the poor. When his son got admission into a college in North America, he said to his dad, you run a multi-million dollar organization. I've just gotten into NYU or something like that. And he said, um, and he said isn't that great news? One of us is going to college. He says, how are you going to pay for it? And he says, what do you mean? He goes, you run this multi-million dollar global organization. What do you mean, how are we going to pay for it? And he goes, it's not our money. And so he worked a paper route for two years and worked two jobs to put himself through college because dad wouldn't fork out a dollar for him to go to university. So this is Abu Saeed, he's about 90 years old. And when we went to go make a small film about him, it ended up being a feature for which we won the Sundance Grant to finish this up. He threw a challenge out there and said, um, look, if you want to know me, just you know, go to the people. That's where all I, I am. I'm old now. You know? And so we ended up following a runaway boy, Pashtun boy, who's trying to make his way back uh, home. And these narratives between him and an ambulance driver that's trying to help him get back home uh, is, um, is what our film's about. So keep us in your prayers with that. You, is the audio? Oh, can I just hit play? Okay. Go ahead. उसकी चरपाई के नीचे कप में रख के और बिल्कुल हल्का सा कुत्ता चला देना इंशाल्लाह सुबह में कमरे में पानी ठंडा भी रहेगा और उसकी डेड बॉडी भी कुछ नहीं रहेगी तो पता नहीं क्या करेगा हां ओ तभी तो दोस्त के घर में इसको ओ बॉस बॉस को दे मैं आपको बता दूं कि मेरा सारा मुंडा पता किया है मेरा दोस्त किया है मैं लोगों के मुंह से किताब पढ़ी है पढ़ पढ़ा तो आप मेरे पास आए 
से रबता क्यों ना करें उनके भूमना है आप अपने इंसानों में उनके भूम सकते हैं मैं आम इंसानों का बंदा हूं और भूमने के लिए मेरे पास आम इंसानों में जाके Okay, I'm going to pull up one more photo, and then we're going to wrap this up. Okay. <laughs> so by that point in Pakistan, I've arrived at a point where I think it doesn't actually matter too much what it is I'm shooting with and I'm happy in my uh, ambivalence. But I want to leave that one photograph up and we'll talk about it in a second. And um, there's, a, there's a quote that I love by a great American uh, filmmaker, uh, John Cassavetes. And uh, he said that sometimes even the camera gets in the way of the movie, which I've always loved. And um, at least with regard to the documentary photography or the film or whatever it is, is that I'm not sure anymore that I have to pick between the rose and the brick. I'm still working that out. And, um, and that perhaps it is just really on a good day if you can clear your intention. It is about just whatever is in front of the camera when even the camera might be getting in the way of the movie. One final anecdote about... Um, Robert, uh, there's a hero of mine, uh, a foreign correspondent, Robert Fisk, who writes for The Independent, who uh, my father is a very stern, difficult man. I would see him smile when he would read Robert Fisk's reports uh, in the 80s in his newspaper growing up, and so I took an interest in him. And uh, I think it's always good to embarrass yourself publicly, to stay humble, but if you ever looked up on YouTube, there's an interview with Robert Fisk where he talks after 30 years of foreign correspondence and wonders and breaks down and starts crying at this lecture in New uh, and says, I wonder if I actually made a difference. So even his brick that wants to be something, he, he wondered whether that something had actually materialized. <clears throat> you know, dissatisfied with a rose being what a rose, he wondered whether the brick had materialized. And you hear a voice yell out and say, but we're here. And that voice is me <laughs> when I was in college. And I, the, the words left my mouth before I could grab them. And he shook his head and said, I don't know, I don't know, you know. But I didn't get into the game to get jaded or cynical or go to areas which are ripe for that. And, um, and I think that, um, you know, I, I think that it's, you know, you, sometimes you do this stuff and you can get a little narcissistic and self-involved with the mission of what it is you want to do. So now I'll talk about this photo. This photo is one of my favorite photos. It's mazar sharif in Afghanistan. That's the mosque in the background. There's a abstract shadows of people heading off to prayer and that's the obvious dove like some miracle on black and white film where all the photographic principles have been broken you've pointed into the light there's no focus and it still remains one of my favorite photos from that region the perhaps the best thing about that photo though uh, as i glow about it immodestly is that it's not mine that that photo belongs to a photographer his name is teru kuayama uh, his mother is uh, Japanese, his father's, uh, uh, sorry, his father's Japanese, mother is American. He grew up in a loft in Soho with uh, Yoko Ono coming over and playing music while he ran off to punk shows. He's not Muslim, he's not Afghan, he's not even from the region. But he has produced some of the most beautiful work out there of these people and cut through the same things that concerned me, who was ethnically Pashtun, right, from that region. And there, over miracles and across divides and over the internet, I come across his photographs when someone tells me I should see it because this is someone doing something that might interest you. 
And that perhaps is the point, be it a rose or brick or anything, uh, or even Cassavetti's non-existent camera, that perhaps you don't get to end war, as some of us have thought, but you do get to pick the side that you are on sometimes, and that may just have to be enough. But you do get to stand, if you're lucky, and say what you want. And it might not just be a brick that wants to be something, sometimes it's even just a photographer. Thank you very much. I almost forgot we, we offered questions, no? Any takers? Sure. Uh, no, the, the, the program initially that we used was um, a Hipstamatic, which oh. is, I think was sort of quite popular. And then what we did was, I worked with a colorist uh, and stuff in New York who, um, I'm actually, what I, I mean, I showed them as I took them just to emphasize some of the, this is with an iPhone and you can see what it looks like. I, I'm completely smitten with the democracy of all new media, despite having worked in it. Most people complain. I'm, I'm quite smitten with it. I think that's fantastic because, um, uh, well, just for the obvious reasons. Um, but I think as I present them, I'm working on a book project with this, and I've, and I've got some very kind, wonderful people interested in the work of Little Brown who said, um, so what I'm doing is I'm probably going to take the edges off, which are part of the filter on iPhone, and then color it more traditionally, so that people actually don't know that it's an iPhone. So that then they can, because as these get, you know, I, I've seen the technology develop and the speed with which it evolves. And I, you know, you want to wrestle from the speed of it something that at least aims at something a little timeless. So we'll probably pull the borders off, put some writing in there, and then just make it about the region. And then as a smuggling on the back end, it was done with the iPhone. I hope that answered your question. Yes. A little long-winded, sorry. At the end of the night, I get that way. <laughs> Anyone else? Sure. Um, to me, it's very interesting in uh, the people and the places that lead you into your destiny, maybe, or your becoming. Mm. Um, and I, as you were speaking, I was thinking, you mentioned a school, and I was wondering what, what kind of a school, and you said public. I was thinking it may have been a water school in a village. Oh no, I, uh, I'm sorry, that's, that's, I think that's a mid-Atlantic model for which I'm guilty. Uh, a public school in England, I think would be called a, called a prep school here. Yeah, I'm emphasizing really the boredom that comes of sitting out in the country in a library somewhere dreaming about being T. Lawrence, you know, which is... It was not a water school? No, no, it was uh, a sort of old stone <laughs> across the English public, uh, what you call a private school here, I think. French fashion um, photographer was that? Um, uh, this, no, there's a guy, Alex Shacklin, and uh, um, uh, I think, uh, but you know, he's part of a crew of other people too, uh, Patrick de Marchelier, is a little more, but um, they were called the French Mafia. They came over in the 60s and brought 35 millimeter photography into fashion and uh, movement and action, and, and they were really great. They were all these like poor kids made good in New York City and perennial uh, adolescents which is, you know, great to be around and, and some great mentors in there too. Sure. Yeah. You, thank you so much for sharing these yes. incredible uh, images. I mean, they're just profound. And I wish this, this auditorium was filled with people. I mean, I, just to be able to see what we've seen tonight is, is a true gift. Uh, I wanted to ask you, as, as um, you said you're ethnically Pashto. Yeah, yeah. As um, being ethnic, Raised, you know, in the West, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, world view. How has your identity, been, and this is probably a huge kind of, you know, no, no, no. question, but um, if you could comment on how your the reemergence of your ethnic identity, or how that yeah. has played into that's a great question. Become your passion. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't have to speak. You're picking this up on the wireless, right? I can straighten my back, <laughs> but um. Uh, okay, I'll try and keep this as short as possible. I, um, I said T. Lawrence, but really one of my heroes is um, a guy, Carlos Mavrolion, who was heir to a shipping fortune um, in the 70s, 80s. He went to Eton, 
and he um, he left Eton at 16 and ran off to Afghanistan during the war with the Russians and uh, became Muslim, learned Pashto, Arabic, Farsi. Two years later, emerged as a commander in the army but after his dad fished him back and told me he would disown him otherwise. He finished up school at Harvard, um, made a killing on Wall Street in the 80s, then when Somalia broke out, ran off to Somalia with a video camera and became the top correspondent over, over there. When 9-11 happened, he went to, um, he went to uh, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, where he was found dead after a long drug habit and also rumors of ISI having murdered him. In his hotel room in Peshawar, which had both a four volume history uh, of Islam, a Quran, and a heroin needle by his bed. Um, he was terrifically good looking, uh, pointlessly good looking, in fact, which made my schoolboy hero worship um, all the easier. But he didn't actually pick. Uh, his identity. And I think that is my long-winded way of answering your question. He didn't actually pick. And I think when I realized as a young guy that I didn't have to pick, that I was as, as at home um, in New York in my jeans or at a, you know, at a, you know with, with old friends in London, uh, you know, besuited from Savile Row or, or out there in the Shilvar dis disappearing into the Hindu Kush. Um, when I realized that I didn't have to pick, um, then I forgot about it. Here's the other thing, I have a five-year-old boy and I want that for him too as well. As we go global in so many ways, I don't want him to have to pick. I want him to have to, to be whatever he wants, whenever he wants. And I think that some of the bilingual, bicultural, or tricultural fluency that I've been very fortunate to inherit, that initially I thought my, was an adolescent problem, uh, may just be a key to a future identity that we're all going to have to contend with as uh, people get a little mixed up. Thank you, that was a great question. Yep. Uh, in the introduction, I just heard that you study uh, politics, philosophy, and economics, yeah. I'm just curious, like, what bring you to become a photography after the economics, politics, and how you combine these two views? Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah my obsessive compulsion disorder in college, met, like I picked, picked up politics, philosophy, and economics, and I then concentrated in philosophy and all this medieval theology. And, and I was convinced I was going to go do a JD, PhD program at graduate school and do philosophy. And then, um, but I always had this sort of, I was always art drunk. And I think ethnically, I, th I thought that film and photography was something somebody else does. That it's not really what I, I'm from typical immigrant parents who are. Um, you know, struggled very hard, and I'm this scholarship kid at prep school, and you know, and all of that thing, that stuff. And I thought that this is something someone else does. You know, and mum that had banged into me that, like, you know, get stability and security, and I was reading T. Lawrence and Ezra Pound and the library. So, um, but uh, um, I saw, you know, the quite romantic, nostalgic versions. I went to a friend's house who'd cast me in his student film where I was having a good old time, and he showed me actually a film by John Cassavetes in my senior year and I walked back home nine blocks and wondered how I was going to tell my parents that I was not going to go to graduate school or law school despite having gotten great grades and all the rest of it. Um, and then I then told my friend Adam, I said, I'm going to run, I was in Philadelphia, I said, I'm going to run off to New York. Uh, if you can get me a job in 24 hours, uh, I'll stick around here because he complained that all our friends had left Philadelphia and he, he, he got me a job, I turned up. The guy was uh, getting high at 8 a.m., had a ponytail, and said, we're shooting this TV show called Jackass, and you're my assistant. My first day on the job, I chased a guy who popped 23 laxatives and ran down the street naked, soiling himself, while I chased him with a camera and got chased by the police, which is probably good training for conflict photography. Um, but yeah, that's how it happened. I'm afraid it's not any more profound than that. Is that it? Okay, great. Uh, public speaking is up there with contending with the Taliban in my anxiety. So thank you all very much for coming. And I, want to, and actually, I, I want to thank everyone at Shangri-La who's uh, been a very kind host and everybody here at the university. You've all been very, very gracious. Thank you.